Associate Dean for Advancement here at the law school. Uh, I have the privilege of going around and meeting alumni, interesting ones, and this is an interesting one. Thomas Fortune Fay uh, practices law in, Fay, in the firm of Fay Kaplan in Washington, D.C. Um, he's a 1965 graduate of the law school. Um, he went on to practice first uh, in-house in a small bank in uh, Delaware, and then he moved to the District of Columbia, where he became a trial lawyer of all kinds of cases, criminal, civil, personal injury. That uh, came to be, and he um, uh, did personal injury, medical malpractice cases, always for the plaintiff's side. Uh, then in the 1990s, um, something changed. Uh, and he was given a case involving terrorism to a, uh, a victim uh, here from here in New Jersey uh, who was murdered in the Gaza Strip. That had started him on a career which uh, he has been engaged in since, in representing victims, uh, American victims of foreign terrorism. I thought he would be... Uh, as scintillating to you as he is to me. And so he is here and has really worked on preparing and giving you um, uh, an idea of the kind of law that he practices. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Don't fight City Hall. You've all heard that, haven't you? Well, John Adams fought City Hall. He went and represented the British troops who fired upon and killed a number of demonstrators in the Boston Massacre. He got a not guilty on all counts. <clears throat> Abraham Lincoln fought City Hall. He went and brought to the country a new form, and that is that everybody, regardless of race, is going to get equality. And he fought City Hall, and that won too. And we're here today really not because of me. I wrote a statue, but it really was not because of me. It's because of Steve Flato. Steve Flato uh, is uh, a hero in my eyes, the, the same as Abraham Lincoln and John Adams. Uh, he is a real estate lawyer. Uh, his office is just down the road in Jersey City and uh, has a, a family. His oldest daughter's name uh, is Elisa. Elisa uh, Flato um, went to Brandeis University, uh, was uh, very much uh, enamored uh, of uh, religion, of, of building a religious base and so forth that sort of spread to the rest of her family. And part of the education at Brandeis was to do a semester in Israel. She went uh, to uh, Israel, was there for several months, and uh, was going to take a short holiday over a, uh, a weekend uh, where there was a nice beach uh, near uh, Gush Katif, it was called, which was in the Gaza Strip, but a part of the Gaza Strip occupied by Israel. She got on a bus which went into the Gaza Strip, went toward uh, uh, a, a small uh, settlement. As it went toward the small settlement before going to the beach, a small delivery truck pulled up alongside of it on the right side. And the suicide bomber pulled a switch and blew himself up. She probably heard some noise and bent over, or maybe she leaned over to pick something up off the floor. But a bolt, just like you see uh, a, a, a lug nut on an automobile, uh, almost certainly from the explode, directly from the explosive charge, came up, hit the roof of the bus, went in behind her right ear, and penetrated into the brain. Um, what's a lot of times called an Abraham Lincoln wound. Um, at that time and today, as it was in 1865, there really is not any treatment for that. It destroys so much of the brain that nothing can be done. Uh, her father, Steve Flato, flew immediately to Israel and was with his daughter for the last couple of days she was alive. Uh, and when there was no brainwave activity, there was no 
choice. They turned off the respirator. Uh, he, at that uh, time, gave permission for there to be an organ uh, transplant. And he went home and contacted the government, uh, talked to them about what, what happens now, what do we do now. Somebody pulled this, this uh, off, somebody caused this, uh, this attack to, uh, to happen. There was information that uh, came to him that this was, began with uh, Iran. That really was not verified at that point until later on. And he was startled to find out that while if you get hit by a car in front of this building, you have a right to go and get a trial and uh, obtain a, a, a damages from the person whose negligence caused that injury, there's nothing if there's an intentional injury uh, from uh, a terrorist state. And he decided he was going to change this. He started going to Washington and talking to people, including uh, one lawyer who I had uh, known uh, once in a while would refer a case to me. And he asked me if I would uh, sit down and, and draw up something that would allow these uh, cases to go forward. So we, I sat down and went through what was needed. The first thing is, this happened outside the United States. How does the United States have jurisdiction uh, to do anything since it happened outside the United States? And what I came up with was the law of the sea. Under the law of the sea, if you're killed or injured due to somebody's negligent or intentional act any place, you have a right to have a proceeding uh, to establish damages if different quantums of proof and so forth. But that set it out, and that covers American citizens or American nationals. I went to American nationals, and what I mean by that is a definition of American uh, nationals. <clears throat> uh, an American national is not a term synonymous with American citizen. An American national is <clears throat> a person who was sworn unqualified allegiance to the United States of America, and a person who at the time has never revoked that uh, allegiance. Uh, the, we therefore went to the, the, the term American national. Later on in, in one of the cases I had, the case growing out of the attack in the Marine Barracks in uh, 1983, uh, there, was the, there was an American uh, national uh, by the name of uh, Kizan. Mr. Kizan had gone through a couple of years of medical school and he enlisted in the United States Navy. He wished to become an American citizen. He was in the headquarters building that was hit uh, on, on October 23rd, 1983 and died in that uh, in headquarters Beirut. building. In Beirut. Huh? In Beirut. Beirut, in Lebanon, yes, in 1983 and uh, uh, died in, in that attack. Um, in the case that followed that, um, uh, the question of how far American national can go comes up. And the papers that you got uh, going down uh, in the second page and following is uh, uh, a part of our brief in that case. Uh, and uh, you don't have to read it all now by any means, that would take some time, but what it did was it pointed out that this person was an American in every way. He gave his life for his country, he had promised unquestioned allegiance to the United States and promised to obey the orders of the President and his officers as a member of the United States Navy. Um, I have to say that the fact that the judge accepted this when this case uh, came up uh, for determination was a, uh, a huge, um, uh, 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 took a huge burden off my shoulders. I say that because uh, uh, Mr. Kizan's mother uh, came to Washington uh, from California. She uh, absolutely was the nicest lady perhaps in the world. 
and, uh, and met her the night before they were going to announce this judgment. And all I could think about all night, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get upset going into the Gaza Strip, going into to Lebanon, doing all kinds of things. But the idea that this thing might come down and not give her an award which she deserved absolutely kept me awake all night. Well, it's a good ending. The judge found in, in our favor and uh, he got an award. But let me get back to how all these cases uh, uh, came about. After figuring the, 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 the definition uh, on this, we had to take into account uh, the Department of State and uh, other parts of the U.S. government. So we limited this to countries that are on the terrorist list established by the Department of State, already established by the uh, Department of State. We also uh, uh, had to uh, set forth what would be a, 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 uh, a limiting uh, thing. So we put down uh, two compensatory damages consisting of pain and suffering, even if death followed, uh, pain and suffering where there's just an injury, but also loss of earnings, so forth, and uh, uh, going uh, on from that, injuries to the persons related uh, to the uh, person who's injured or killed in the terrorist event. We did that because the purpose of a terrorist attack, if you were the person immediately injured, you are the tool to a large extent, not the objective. The objective is through causing you pain, perhaps your death, injury, the objective is to intimidate the country that you're a member of, that you're a national of. That's the objective. And unfortunately, too often uh, it's worked that it has intimidated the United States. But that's what we were trying to do, was to get some way of making them pay uh, for all of this. Um, it, how do you go about doing that? Well, the first thing was we knew that we had to, uh, uh, to get some kind of proof that indeed Iran was, uh, was the sponsoring party on this. And uh, I felt in Washington, D.C. that the people that uh, probably knew the most about it in town would be the people up at the uh, Israeli embassy. Now, it's a good thing in these cases to have good luck. And, and I've always considered myself to have good luck. I went up to the Israeli embassy to talk to whoever was up there who knew about these cases. And I spoke to a general of the Shin Bet, the Israeli intelligence uh, service, Israeli security service, who was the Israeli counsel to the United Nations. This will sound ridiculous, but I got along fine with them because it turned out I went to Notre Dame, and he was a Notre Dame football fan. <laughs> now, I know that sounds crazy, but this is, this is where things come from. You, you establish a personal ground with people, and at that time, there was a lot of pressure on from the, the Clinton administration in power then, a lot of pressure on the Israelis not to cooperate. Well, he, he said, well, I don't know so much about this, but my friend does. So I went to Israel and called up his friend and, uh, and went to see uh, uh, his, uh, his friend. And I asked him how he knew about this. He said, well, I just retired as the director of research. That means the director of intelligence for Shin Bet, the Israeli National Security Service. And it turned out that his office had intercepted a message from Mois, the Ministry of Information and Security of the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran to the Palestinian Islamic Jihad who claim responsibility, congratulating them on their, on their joint effort to hurt Israelis and Americans. They knew Americans are probably beyond this bus because they, they knew that this, this was a, a place where people went uh, uh, on vacation. So we had that part of it beginning to be uh, uh, established. And uh, uh, w at the same time, we got uh, uh, expert testimony uh, from uh, our man, Ruven, 
uh, who uh, uh, on the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, what they did, how were they constituted, and, and so forth. We, we had put in the bill the salation uh, and, and didn't define it. And, and I'm sure if you go to your English teacher, they'll probably look and say, there's no such word as salation in the English dictionary. Well, now there is a word in there because it's been adopted by the courts. And it means within one degree of, of latitude, it means uh, to your parents, siblings, or children, you can collect damages for intentional infliction of mental distress. Those damages obsessed against uh, Iran in several cases have been about 85% of the total damages awarded. The reason for that is that in most states, the uh, common law variant, in other words, the statute passed to allow damages uh, in a wrongful death, limits it sometimes to just earnings, other times to, but it's a low quantum, no matter where it is. 85% were the damages paid to the relatives of uh, people uh, who have been killed or injured in uh, a terrorist event. That's important because it makes uh, those people, uh, again, they become an instrument of our country to make these guys pay. And it's important that they, that they pay. Now, <clears throat> We went to trial on, on that case, and uh, the judge uh, uh, held in our favor. Um, we got one uh, contact from the administration that asked us if we would take uh, $1 million uh, in the payment from the United States Treasury, and uh, uh, my uh, client and I both felt this wasn't anything we were asking the United States Treasury to pay. This is something we wanted the Iranians to pay. In the end, with interest, Iran ended up paying $29 million on uh, this case. There had never been a collection before this, and uh, $29 million were now. One of the results of this is they've, they've taken steps to try and further cover up and, and uh, you know, terrorist events uh, uh, since then. Now, <clears throat> the, the measure which allows uh, any American to uh, collect is what's called material support. I wrote that into the statute because I really felt that this being uh, uh, an action which obviously is illegal under uh, international law, an action which obviously was a criminal offense, that um, uh, it would be virtually impossible to hook up uh, the country itself, uh, which uh, had committed the offense, uh, with the act. But we possibly could show that there was some material support. That is to say, did they provide ammunition? Did they provide explosives? Did they provide any number of things that would assist in the terrorist attack? We didn't have that problem in the Flato case uh, because of the intercept of the message. In the, the later cases, um, that hasn't really been a problem. In the next uh, two cases that we uh, had, uh, were the Eisenfeld and Duker cases. Uh, both uh, 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 Sarah Duker was also a New Jersey resident. I don't know how or why New Jersey suffered so much more than anyone else in this, but uh, was also a New Jersey resident. Uh, finished at the top of her class at Barnard College. She was on a scholarship uh, uh, in graduate school uh, in uh, biology and uh, uh, Matt Eisenfeld, uh, who was her boyfriend, they intended to get married, came over uh, to Israel. He had graduated from Yale and then gone to the Jewish Theological Seminary, he wanted to be a rabbi. And they were on a, a bus uh, going uh, down 
of the street, Ben Yehuda Street in Israel, uh, when a suicide bomber on the bus set off six pounds of explosive. Six pounds, that's all. I mean, you go to the, the supermarket and, and you can get six pounds of hamburger and it probably won't feed more than a couple of people. I mean, that's all it took. Six pounds of C4 took the whole top of the bus off, and this is a bus just like the ones around here. It wasn't, it wasn't um, something out of the prehistoric times or anything. And it blew it almost 100 yards down the street. It killed uh, uh, Sarah and Matt um, and, and uh, another 15 people, 18 people on, uh, on the bus. Um, so the question then becomes, how did this come about? Well, uh, and how do we prove it? About two weeks after the event, the person who actually set up this bombing um, was a man by the name of Hassan Salome. He was in a vehicle uh, trying to drive back toward the Gaza Strip. He was stopped at uh, an Israeli roadblock, tried to run it, was shot by the guard and captured. Once captured, uh, he not only didn't stay silent, he openly bragged about what he had done and where he had gone and how he had prepared for it. And what he had done was he grew up in the Gaza Strip. He got out of the Gaza Strip uh, into Egypt, was uh, taken uh, by Iranian military aircraft uh, to Sudan, where he underwent six months of indoctrination. And from there, he was taken to uh, a camp uh, just outside Tehran. In this camp, the only people he saw were instructors. He never saw anybody else who was going to go into Israel for terrorism or just for intelligence or for anything else. And what that really details uh, is that this was, this was not an off-the-cuff amateur operation that was ongoing. They operated the same way as a Western intelligence service in that a person being inserted into what they consider an enemy country doesn't know anybody else who has any connection with the operation or with the, their government at all. None whatsoever. He was then uh, given a whole string of instructions. One of them was how to operate uh, uh, automatic weapons, how to operate uh, 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 various types of, of machinery, uh, how to uh, uh, defuse uh, mines. Now that might seem strange, but um, one of the things we did in this, because we thought it would help us and be able to hook everything up uh, to what he admitted to, uh, was get a run on uh, the place of manufacture of the explosive that was uh, uh, used uh, to kill the people on the bus at Ben Yehuda Street. And we did find out where it was manufactured. It was manufactured in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, and to uh, go out in, onto the line between uh, the uh, state of Israel uh, and Egypt, where there are literally millions of mines buried on both sides, a high number percentage of them being uh, mines manufactured in the United States, which at one time or another have been sold to either country. They took the mines apart, took the explosive out, and that's what they used. Uh, it, it didn't take anything, uh, anything more than that. Um, then, it, if, as if we needed any more help from him, CBS News called him up. I know this sounds almost like fantasy, like it couldn't possibly happen, but it did. CBS News called him up and said, we'd like to talk to you, and you understand that you were the leading uh, operator in uh, these uh, terrorist attacks, and, and see what your views are. So the, that was okay with the Israelis, uh, absolutely. And uh, so they came to the prison where he was being held, and he described all this, how we took the mine, the mine apart, how they drained out the, uh, the substance that was inside, the explosive, 
uh, how he went to see his cousin and convinced his cousin that his cousin should become a martyr, how they set this thing up to be on uh, the, the bus that uh, ran along Ben Yehuda Street because tourists got on that, particularly Americans, uh, on this particular bus because it was going over to the archaeological remains over across the River Jordan. All of that came out and we subpoenaed and got a copy of the CBS News um, uh, videotape. All of it was taught to them in Iran. So there was no question as to who would <coughs> carry out that attack uh, as well. In the case of the Marine barracks, um, we, uh, I wanted to, to be sure that we had everything uh, squarely uh, in place. And I went to uh, a friend of mine whose name will, will remain out of this, a friend of mine for many years, and asked, uh, I, I was hoping, that there would be somebody in the United States who had defected from uh, Iran uh, or perhaps from one of the, the groups uh, working with Iran uh, and come to the United States that we could talk to. So after about six months, uh, such a person uh, was uh, found, well, not completely. Uh, it was a person still in Lebanon who had uh, uh, left Hezbollah and, uh, and was willing to uh, describe what happened, who felt some guilt for what happened. And uh, uh, a videographer who had been deputized by the United States District Court for the District of Columbia to take oaths any place in the world, went in with me and the two uh, former uh, intelligence officers went there before. Um, what impressed me most about all of this was when we flew into Cyprus where we dropped everything that would show any connection uh, with Israel or with any American court thing, the videographer and myself. And when we got on the line to get on the plane uh, that uh, flew over from Cyprus to, to Beirut, the person that was uh, checking the passports behind the desk uh, looked at my passport and said, oh yes, Mr. Fay, your friend said to go to the hotel, something gave a name. And I, Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> they were afraid that the other hotel that they gave us before had been discovered. And um, uh, we got on the plane and <clears throat> fortunately, it was all covered by uh, one of the worst storms they'd had in the Eastern Mediterranean in, in 50 years. Uh, it dumped all kinds of snow uh, onto the mountains. The plane bounced all over the place to the extent that uh, they kept uh, uh, a crew in uh, the tower at the airport, but the regular security crew at the airport all went home. They didn't think any more planes were going to get in that night. Well, that plane did, and our friends were there to meet us. So we got in, and nobody knew we were there, and took the deposition of uh, a man that we call Mahmoud, that being, uh, we thought, the most common name in uh, uh, in. Uh, in Lebanon, and he described in detail how they had gotten a truck that was the same make, same type as the truck that uh, delivered all the sodas and everything into the machines at the airport. And uh, they bought sodas, so forth and so on, to the outside of the truck. And then in the interior of the truck, they placed 22,000 pounds 11 tons of PETN, uh, and uh, they had a driver who had been brought in from uh, uh, from Iran to drive that truck. They didn't, they really didn't trust any of the the uh, Lebanese to drive uh, the truck. On the uh, early morning question, as as the real truck was going on its route. Uh, a car swerved and stopped in front of it, and they pushed it into a place, took it over, substituted this truck, and uh, it came to where the Marine barracks was, 
went, went around uh, the front and the airfield be over there uh, to this end where there was a fence um, made up of barbed wire, concertina wire, and there were some uh, guards behind the fence. It crashed through the fence. Now, for the guards there on the outside, um, they were operating under waters from uh, the Secretary of Defense, directly from the Secretary of Defense to them, uh, what are name, known as rules of engagement. The rules of engagement were they could not have a round chambered in their weapon. They could have a clip in the weapon, but not a round chambered. They could only chamber around upon order of an officer. The officer could only give the uh, order to chamber around uh, if there was incoming fire, and then he could order them to give return fire. There was no instruction on what might be done in a situation like this, nor there was an officer there that could have given such an order. And they had to stop shooting as soon as uh, the, 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 whoever was shooting at them had stopped. One of the things when we went to trial was the question of, was this a situation simply of armed soldiers on either side who were shooting at each other? Is this really a war? Well, it wasn't. In a war, if you see the enemy, you can shoot. This wasn't, this wasn't that. And to demonstrate that, we put up a, a sheet which had on the, on the sheet the rules of engagement, which I'd just given you for the Marines there, and the rules of engagement for a civilian walking down the street in the District of Columbia that same day. For the civilian in the District of Columbia that same day as the trial was on, if somebody took a shot at him or presented a threat to him and he had a weapon, he could fire to stop the threat, to stop from being killed. He could shoot until the threat was over with. He didn't have to stop. He didn't have to have an officer there. He didn't have to have any of those things. I mean, he had more, a more liberal uh, rule and when he could engage and use weapons than the Marine that was there in essentially a, a, a situation that was like a war. That's what was going on in Lebanon. Uh, there was a... Uh, they had lost two or three people, the snipers, in the week before, but it didn't make any difference. They couldn't do anything. The sergeant of the guard saw this truck break through, and he, uh, he screamed at the, uh, at the guard right at the building, run like hell. And he ran into the building, which was like the atrium of a, of a Hyatt, as I say, it's an atrium roof hollow center and then the roof up above. The reason for all the explosives is uh, explosive force like water follows the path of least resistance. You have an atrium roof, most of it goes up and will lift the roof up. So they needed 11 tons. The only thing left of the truck, this is a big truck, and the only thing left of the truck was the front wheel assembly, the explosives being in, in the back and everything else was just blown into such small pieces they couldn't even be identified. The building was made of reinforced concrete. It turned the reinforced concrete into little grains like sand. Reinforcing rods inside the concrete, several of them bounced off the operations tower one mile away. That's how great it was. It is believed to be the largest non-nuclear explosion ever set off by mankind on earth and it killed 241 marines and injured uh, uh, at least a, a like uh, a like number um, we were very fortunate in in having uh, the cooperation of uh, several people uh, on on the uh, putting together the whole thing including the uh, uh, the uh, man from the FBI who was an expert in explosives. You get an idea of the contrast between 
um, uh, let's say, what orders are given. Um, that man's name was Dan Danny Diefenbaugh, he's still alive, lives down in Texas now. And uh, he came in to do the analysis on all the explosives. And uh, he, he asked that uh, a company of uh, Marines be detailed to him to help him pick up stuff that could be used to analyze what the explosive was, where it was, so forth and so on, and therefore, and he said the first thing he did was get the Marines were detailed to him in a big room and say, okay, look, at this point you're no longer under the command of the United States Marine Corps. You're under the command of the FBI, okay? I want you to get uh, uh, an armored personnel carrier out there with a cannon tomorrow morning, and if we get any incoming fire, return it immediately, and hit him with the cannon. So he said, we had about 25 minutes of that, that was it, it, uh, it disappeared. And he described uh, the, how the damage happened to the building, the effect of all this, it, it was uh, immensely uh, 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 helpful to us in proving this. In, uh, uh, we, we managed to get a judgment in that, that's the reason uh, one of the reasons that uh, uh, I'm here, we got a, a judgment all together, uh, several judgments put together because we had people joining on later for about uh, four, a little over four billion dollars. Two billion dollars is, is uh, being held uh, by a trustee designated by us uh, pending the outcome of the appeal. Uh, yesterday evening, uh, Iran filed uh, their brief in the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, that case will probably be on uh, for, uh, for a hearing uh, on January 19th or 20th that they follow the usual way of scheduling it. If you want to look it up at any point uh, and you go uh, on your computer to Supreme Court of the United States uh, and look up docket, uh, the docket number is 14-770, and there's no charge for that. You can take a look at, uh, at uh, their brief. I don't know whether they, they charge uh, getting a copy of the brief. That might steer you an outside service and you have to give them a credit card number or something. But it, we, what you can find out on that too is when there's going to be an oral argument, there will be a uh, something come up uh, probably toward the end of December. We'll be filing our brief uh, December 16th on that. So um, we've gone on from that. In the East African Embassy uh, cases, um, there was uh, a statement made by a man uh, who uh, uh, was a, a turncoat. Uh, he made a statement to try and avoid capital punishment, which he did. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, described a meeting between uh, Osama bin Laden uh, and uh, uh, the head of uh, Hezbollah uh, operations uh, uh, in uh, Khartoum and uh, uh, described how they planned out the uh, attack and, uh, and so forth. In that case, uh, we, I should add along the way, in, uh, nine, in uh, 2008, we got through uh, a, an additional uh, statute. We've gotten through, I think, seven statutes at this point, but this one was particularly significant because it, it covered not only American nationals, as I described them previously, but it also covers members of the armed forces of the United States particularly, uh, who are injured or, or killed uh, in a terrorist attack or persons employed by the United States injured or killed in the course of their duties. And uh, it also did away with uh, one of the uh, defenses uh, that uh, uh, Iran would use in protecting its assets that if you have, uh, uh, in, in effect, treated Iran like as if it was a corporation and the nominal holder of the asset is a subsidiary where you had to show day-to-day -day control over that subsidiary in order to levy on that asset, which uh, makes sense if you're talking about uh, 
uh, General Motors or the DuPont Company, it makes no sense at all where you're talking about a terrorist enterprise. Anyone that comes forward and, and describes the day-to-day -day activities of some outfit like that, um, I would advise uh, find a stupid kid to start your car every morning because something bad's going to happen to you. And uh, uh, so that, uh, that we, we, we've, gotten, we've gotten past uh, that. I should add, too, in that case, we have about a billion dollar judgment that we are enforcing now, and that judgment for the first time uh, includes foreign nationals who were employed by the United States government. Um, and I represent a number of them, another lawyer represents some others, but the ones that, that I represent uh, are all Tanzanian uh, nationals who are members of the local security force guarding the embassy. Um, you probably all heard of the back and forth stuff with what happened in Benghazi and about the, why weren't the Marines here or something. The average number of Marines at uh, an American embassy is six. That's for 24 hour protection, six. You know, the, the Marines aren't there because they can't cover the hundreds of, uh, 100, something like 150 some embassies. You know, uh, that, even that's uh, uh, more than the battalion of Marines. You don't have that many Marines running around. Uh, so that most of the security is handled by native security. The people that I represent in that, when this truck drove up, would not allow the truck to get up next to the embassy. They would not open the gate and the guy detonated the explosives in the truck. Uh, about 35, 40 feet away from the embassy. It doesn't seem like much, but it was enough so the building rocked, but it did not come down. Uh, uh, eight of them were killed uh, in, the, in that attack. And uh, because of their actions, uh, not a single American at that embassy was killed in that attack. There were Americans killed in the simultaneous attack up at Nairobi, but not in the attack at Dar es Salaam. Um, which would, is really something that I hope the Congress takes into effect. We have a bill uh, underway. Uh, I see the crocs going on. <laughs> we have a bill underway in Congress now which uh, uh, will bring in uh, the, those people uh, to the Anti-Terrorism Act. Now, in, on the, the, the front piece of what you have as shown up here, Foreign state defendants all come over under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, and uh, it gives the site there for the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. As you can see, they operate somewhat differently. I'm not going to read down these because we're not, we don't have that much time left, and I, I want to give you folks a chance to ask some questions. Uh, and uh, uh, the Anti-Terrorism Act does not apply to foreign states, but applies to individuals uh, who carry out something or aid and abet. By individuals, I use that term loosely, I didn't have room there to put individuals including corporations, but it includes any organization that, uh, that works in one of these attacks on Americans in a terrorist event. Okay, questions? Yes, sir. Uh, in the 90s, why was the Clinton administration opposed to your original investigation? The uh, Clinton uh, administration was opposed in court. Uh, they made the argument that foreign relations was wholly within the province of the uh, executive branch. Uh, I, I read off to them, they actually carry around the Constitution all the time. And um, the, the uh, executive branch, with the uh, approval of two-thirds of the Senate, can make a treaty. The executive branch, with the approval of Congress, can initiate uh, tariffs and things like that. Or they can receive uh, ambassadors and consuls. And uh, that's, I don't read that. The Supreme, I've got to tell you honestly, the Supreme Court often tends to read it as though that means 
anything you want to do that you can put the naval foreign relations on, uh, the executive branch has the power to do that. Obviously, the president wanted to preserve that. Uh, it's, a, it's really a question of the power of the executive as opposed to the power of Congress. Now, that very question is probably going to be up in uh, this Supreme Court proceeding uh, that uh, uh, it's 14-770. It's, uh, so it's, it's something that has been back and forth for uh, uh, years and years and years. You have all kinds of uh, things. Probably the first step in this was Andrew Jackson's thing when there was a, a decision by the Supreme Court that he didn't like and uh, his reply to the Supreme Court uh, deciding contrary to his uh, wishes was the Chief Justice made the decision, let him go try to enforce it. So, yes. Yes, sir. Okay, two questions. Uh, I imagine that uh, you have had uh, American nationals victims of terrorism prior to the 1980s. Yes. So in the 1970s, I imagine that uh, uh, it happened, so they never received uh, compensation, or did they? They, uh, well, the ones that have, or the Marines are going to receive compensation one, uh, one way or another. I mean, we're going to keep but going. But for the victims one. of the 1970s, for instance? No, they, they haven't at this point. Uh, if somebody had come forward from a terrorist event, we could have of, uh, gotten them compensation uh, because the statute of limitations for, for both the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act and um, uh, the uh, uh, Anti-Terrorism Act is 10 years now. But it dates from the date that you could bring an action. So that it dates in the case of the, uh, uh, the, the addition, for instance, of, of uh, uh, people working for the United States in 2008. That statute runs till 2018, but also I would think, there's I would think that if somebody came forward on and said that they were a victim of an attack during this period, and it was not known until now that uh, a country on the terrorist list uh, had participated in it, we could probably get some legislation through to allow those type of acts. But people haven't. Uh, uh, haven't done that. And so the, the, wish fact they would. That, the, the fact that you won these cases uh, is very important for the way forward because now you have precedent yes. and uh, it's going to be called upon as a way to assign accountability and responsibility, right? Yes. Yeah. So it's, it's historical in a way in terms of the, the, the weight of these cases and so on. Yes. And, and the, 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 the second question, which is a yeah. follow up question, so you mentioned $2 billion in this fund which you, 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 you claim or you. you if you win, uh, we go to the families of the victims, right? Well, um, approximately 87% of it uh, will. 13%, we have entered into an agreement with other people holding judgments. These are all the people holding judgments that were trying to enforce them at the time we wrote up the agreement. We brought them all in. They had claims that were inferior to ours. Mm -hmm. Our people uh, uh, felt that they did not want to be the sole recipients in this that these other people had suffered too. And, and uh, we took a poll of everyone in our group and um, we had three things that they could mark. No, we don't uh, want to do this. Yes, we do want to do this. Or the other one is we don't, do, don't agree with this, but if the majority do, we agree. And um, we had four or five do that, and uh, the rest of almost 1,400 people said, yes, we want to do this. And, and so, so uh, do you feel that you, you're going to win the case? And, yes. And, uh, and, and what is the, the time frame? I mean, when will it happen? Uh... I think we're going to get a decision from the Supreme Court uh, by uh, June 30th. I say June 30th. The end of June is the end of the Supreme Court uh, 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 session, mm -hmm. and uh, I haven't looked at the calendar to see if the 30th, make sure the 30th isn't on a Saturday or Sunday, <laughs> but 
uh, the last business day of June, let's say, is, is going to be uh, and, and the money is Iranian money, which happens to be in the U.S. floating around, right? Yes, it was money. There was two billion two hundred and fifty million dollars. We got information uh, from pursuant uh, to a subpoena uh, from the Department of the Treasury that there was two billion two hundred and fifty million dollars in uh, international uh, internationally registered bonds uh, being held by Citibank uh, under uh, a uh, uh, a name of Clearstream Banking Inc. Uh, Clearstream Banking Inc. claimed to be holding this for a holder who was uh, not uh, Iran. It, uh, uh, however, the U.S. Department of Justice uh, provided us, uh, us with information, U.S. Department of the Treasury, I should say, provided us with information. Indeed, they were the owner. and. Uh, um, that was uh, the uh, the end of that. They're still fighting the thing, but I don't think they're going to uh, to uh, win it. Um, that's where we are. And you have been, uh, and Robert. Me. I want to say two things yes. that that strike me about um, uh, what Tom has done. First of all, from the standpoint of of practice, of a lawyer's practice. Tom was a personal injury lawyer. He became the president of the Trial Lawyers Association of the District of Columbia. He applied personal injury techniques to this whole new world of international terrorism. How to establish liability, how to, go, how to prove pain and suffering. Um, and he also did this on a contingent fee. This is going on decades. Personal injury lawyers have to be able to finance themselves um, for long periods of time. And this is the longest of times that I'm aware of. I mean, the <laughs> hardest of recovery. 15 years. 15. 15 years. So this is a law firm going forward on this. Yes, the pot may be big. Uh, the pot is big if he can get to it. And we don't know if he can get to it. The second is the size of the recovery. As lawyers, uh, and I used to practice, one goes after, often lawyers are either prosecuting or defending collection <coughs> cases. You're going after people who haven't paid on contracts or other things, and you're suing for $30,000, $100,000, $200,000. Nobody, nobody has a case where there's $2 billion. No one I know anyway. <laughs> and it's the finding of the money. He can have plenty of judgments, and he went to trial and got judgments. But to have judgments that don't have assets behind them, it's worthless. He found money, and that money is being held uh, by the court or as an instrumentality of the court. Um, and that can satisfy the judgment. So you have to find the investigative techniques that he used um, to find that money and to establish it within the confines of legislation. What may not have been clear at the beginning was he wrote the first of the statutes um, that he's talking about. He wrote it in the early 90s and Congress passed it. So he not only has been engaging in the courts, but he's been engaging in the US Congress with help by others. So I wanted to sort of point those out from the sort of uh, practical sides of things. Thanks. Incidentally, uh, Frank uh, Lautenberg, uh, who passed away a couple of years ago, U.S. Senator from New Jersey, was very, very uh, helpful on this. Um, there were a number of, uh, uh, of other people uh, that were, uh, were helpful along the way. Um, we, um, we had uh, 51 co-sponsors on the bill that got through in, in, uh, in 1968. Um, so a lot of people were, were in on it. Hillary Clinton was one of them. Schumer was one of them. Senator Schumer was one of them. Um, we, um, we, we always tried to get an equal number of Democrats and Republicans to avoid any of the 
cat fighting in house. Let's not wreck the corpse, guys. <laughs> so, so in a, in a way, not only that you move from one field to another, but you use one field, I mean, based on what Rob is saying, to create another field, to, 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 to pursue a case at the international level in, in, the, in the context of civil action, right, Rob? Yes, that's what I would say. Yeah. I got, uh, when we got the, the, the bill through, we got a bill through in 2012, and I got a call at 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, that uh, uh, to see Harry Reid the next morning at 8 o'clock, and Harry Reid said it's going on for a vote today, and it'll be it'll be done. And uh, he's, he's he did an, an enormous uh, uh, amount uh, amount for us. He really did. Um, <clears throat> another another uh, uh, guy who uh, who did is a uh, uh, U.S. Uh, representative. Uh, from uh, New York that's always on. I'm trying to fish his name out of my failing memory here. Um, he was on the uh, radio this morning. King? Uh, King, King, yeah. He's been terrific. Um, he, uh, he came to a thing like this with me uh, uh, out at uh, Notre Dame Law School uh, back about uh, oh, six months ago or so. And uh, uh, same kind of uh, thing. So, and I want to say one more thing. Yeah. So the name of the case that Tom's given you the docket of is Bank Markazi versus Peterson uh, in the U.S. Supreme Court. And Tom has won in the and the district court, in the court of appeals, and uh, the other side, the bank, took it to the Supreme Court on a petition for cert. The Iranian um, side, you mean, Rob? The the Iranian side. The Iranian yeah. side. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. The Iranian side took it to the Supreme Court, which has discretion in a petition for certiorari to take it. They did something unusual. They put out a request to the Solicitor General uh, of the United States whether um, the Solicitor General had an opinion on the case, because the United States isn't involved in this, in this case. And the Solicitor General um, uh, said he uh, didn't have a, uh, he didn't oppose the case. He, said, said he, he supported us. He wrote about a 21-page oh, brief in support of us, which is unusual. I mean, he could have just said we choose not to take a position or just said we think it should be denied, and that's the only thing he wrote. But they wrote a, a I think it was a 21-page decision on that, and you, I believe, can get a copy of that off the docket as well. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, Tom goes to the court, uh, and, and he won't be arguing yet. Um, uh, but they are—he's uh, in the—he's he, the defender of this. He's the respondent to the petition. Um, but we'll see what happens. Tell, tell them I, who's representing. I heard, on, I, I heard on Ted Olson to argue it. Ted Olson represented uh, uh, Bush and Bush versus Gore. Uh, I mean, he's a hardline. Uh, registered Republican, I'm a hardline registered Democrat. <laughs> but what we're, what we're talking about here is, is winning. And uh, uh, he fights for whoever he's representing. He represented uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the pro-freedom group in the uh, uh, marriage uh, between persons of the same sex uh, and won that case. Um, he uh, uh, he also uh, represented the uh, Americans who were really cheated by Argentina in AML versus Argentina. Um, he's just a, uh, a tremendous, uh, uh, a tremendously skilled uh, person uh, in, in handling Supreme Court things. And the Supreme Court, if you go to a, an argument up the Supreme Court, there are a couple people who haven't been there again. Bring a towel to mop up the blood. I mean, I've seen, <laughs> I've seen them really, really um, just decimate uh, people that that haven't been up there before. They uh, um, there were a couple people, and I'll leave their names out of this. A couple <laughs> people up there that really want to put the hurt on every young lawyer that comes up in front of them. And uh, so I got one that's not so uh, so young as I. As Ted Olson said to me in the meeting we had a couple of uh, weeks ago, he said, I noticed we're both born in the same year. 
1940. I said, yeah, Ted, that was a good, good year for people. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what do you think will be the legacy of the case? I think a legacy, one of the legacies is going to be that, uh, you know, you don't have to have a statute that says the government should do this and so. Establish a cause of action that every citizen can go and find a lawyer or represent them and prosecute the thing themselves. Don't leave it up to the uh, government. Get, establish a cause of action that'll, that'll treat uh, this wrong and turn it around. And then you're going to get action because people will go hire on a lawyer and go do something. And do you know of other lawyers in other countries, you know, following your path and trying to 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 to, to international. win cases? I mean, to internationalize your 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 there, there innovation. Are, there are some, but in most European countries, uh, there there is uh, not a jury demand. I'm, I'd love the jury. We have the jury, of course, in the anti-terrorism act uh, cases, but we don't have in the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act cases. I wish we did, because I think we get uh, bigger verdicts uh, from them, although the judges have done fine with us. I'm not complaining a single bit. But I, I think the, 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 the judicial power really is the ultimate power. Uh, I, I remember- It makes a difference, you think? Yeah, I, I remember uh, representing somebody in a uh, criminal trial in uh, Prince George's County, Maryland once, and I said, you know, today, the people sitting on this jury are more powerful than the people you send to the state legislature and more powerful than the governor of Maryland and more powerful than the U.S. congressman you send or the two U.S. senators and more powerful than the president of the United States because only you have the power to say guilty and send somebody to jail or not guilty and say, this wasn't right, we're going to set it right. And, and you think that not having a jury system in other countries makes it more difficult to pursue these cases? I, I, think, it's, I think it's more, I think it's tougher, yeah. Um, uh, I, I think... Uh, <coughs> because there is less empathy, less identification with the, the victims? I think it was a French philosopher mm -hmm. that once said there's more there's more truth in public opinion than in all the statesmen past, present, and to come. <laughs> that was probably Talleyrand, but I can't remember which one it was. <laughs> you countryman. <laughs> Do we have a final question? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so with regards to uh, the side of the defense of these cases, are they arguing more so that it's not uh, that the money shouldn't be seized and used for this, or are they arguing for the are they, are they arguing against like the culpability of the Iranians, or are they arguing both? Well, it, they're they're arguing two things uh, in this. First thing is that the Congress didn't have the power to pass this uh, one statute uh, because this was dictating the result in the case. It wasn't. The judge still had to decide that this was something that was owned by uh, Iran. The other, the other thing uh, uh, goes to um, uh, really whether or not there's, there's uh, uh, some type of sovereign immunity left uh, for a terrorist country. And uh, my feeling and the whole spirit of the anti-terrorism uh, amendments uh, is to once you engage in a terrorist act, uh, whether it's Iran, no matter who it is, you give up uh, sovereign immunity. And uh, that's, that's all there is about it. And I think that's the way it should be. Can no chance? No more questions? I have, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, do you think your law will have a like, big legacy the more we go into this non-state actors field? So do you think like, how to deal with non-state actors, like taking your law, do we tie them to states like this Hezbollah, or do we charge them with individuals, aid and their bad The problem with most non-state actors is it's very, very difficult to find any asset that they have title to mm -hmm. and, and, and or any kind of recognizable ownership uh, interest. So it becomes very difficult to, to collect in the end on, on the thing. So in the end we just... We but there are some, yeah, there are some uh, cases 
uh, that have uh, uh, come out against non-state actors uh, like the Lind against the Arab Bank, and there are some cases uh, uh, having to do with a couple of what really were sort of uh, uh, phony uh, relig so-called religious corporations, people claiming that they were hooked up uh, either with uh, uh, some part of Islam when they were not, I mean, they were just people going around getting money out of people or some uh, uh, Christian or Jewish group just getting money out of people. Well, if, the, if, it's, if it's an organized group, you might you can find an asset usually. But the things with terrorism, it's it's difficult to find an asset that you can mm -hmm. levy on. Mm -hmm. And listening to Yulia, if I may, Rob, an additional question. I mean, how do you go from civil responsibility or civil liability to criminal liability? You know, you are, you know, so Iran is recognized as, as responsible, for instance. So, so the, you know, the, the money uh, goes to the victim. What, what about in terms of criminal liability for Iran? Well, the criminal so liability... So is it beyond the reach or...? Well, that still stays with the, with the United States government. Mm -hmm. They have to go, uh, the criminal liability. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are some exceptions in, in that. I think in the, in the state of Nebraska, Every citizen has the right to file a case asserting criminal liability against anyone that's violated a criminal law against them, even if the prosecutor doesn't want to. They hire on a lawyer, they file a complaint. But, but in, in the case of non-state actors, I mean, because yeah, this, you, imagine, you know, it's difficult to, and you are responding, it's difficult to identify us, think about ISIS, you know, mm -hmm. how do you, you know, reach out to the money. But then is it possible to use civil liability as a step stone towards criminal liability? Well, sure, you can, you can think up ways to, 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 to make it a step stone. You're going to... ISIS, of course, claims that they are a state, at yeah, least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know how many people would recognize it as a state. Mm -hmm. I, um, my question with ISIS really is, I, I have difficulty believing that uh, this group out in the middle of the desert really has the income from um, bringing oil up out of the ground with the most rudimentary methods to be able to support all this. Mm -hmm. I think there has to be some other um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, answer in this. Someone is... is so you think is, someone is fighting yeah, ISIS? Someone is, is supporting uh, ISIS, mm -hmm. in my opinion. I just don't see how you could, you could do that. I mean, you're, you're, not, you're not talking about uh, some agricultural thing where, you know, somebody owns 5,000 acres and grow beans, sell them, and make a living. Mm -hmm. Well, taking oil up out of the ground isn't that easy. No. Uh, I, I, I just think somebody up, uh, somebody supporting them. I don't know, pr pretend to, to know who it is. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think an awful lot of the reports, I think there's so many things happening in Iraq and Syria that most of the time uh, people on both sides don't know who the hell they're shooting at even. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.